What we're going to be studying today is instrumental variables. So we've kind of moved on and there'll be obviously linkages between what we're studying today and difference in difference. Um, and I'll try and point to some of these, but what we're going to be talking about today is instrumental variables. And so the topic kind of comes from the idea of like in so many of the examples we talked about, we wanted to estimate the effect of some treatment DI on Y. Like, you know, I would say like, look, you want to know this um, average treatment effect. And really the concern in the end was that the estimate was gonna be biased. And so in so many of these research designs, what we're, what we're doing is we're saying, how can we solve that? How can we propose a design um, such that we can estimate this causal parameter that we're interested in? And in circumstances where we had strong ignorability, like for example, we had randomized something, we were pretty confident that that wasn't a concern. And so, the question was, is how, what about when this isn't the case? So what if we need to create random variation in our treatment D as if we had sort of strong ignorability? And, um, you know, a really good example of this, we'll come back to this when we write it out in potential outcomes, is something like where I've randomized half of you to a treatment, or, you know, you can include me in this, and we've randomized each other to a treatment, but then those who get randomized into the treatment don't necessarily take up the treatment. So for example, it's like I prescribe you medicine, half of you the control, half of you the treatment. For those who are ascribed the treatment, you don't necessarily take the treatment and you choose not to. And potentially in the group that doesn't get assigned it, you choose to take the treatment. So there can be elements to which what we're looking at when we compare the randomization is not basically what we were interested in, which is the true effect of one thing on the other. And so the question becomes, how do we get at that estimate that we're interested in? And so the very popular solution is what gets termed, you know, instrumental variables. And there's really a ton of material to cover regarding IV. So there's, there's, you know, there's nitty gritty on issues to worry about. There's nitty gritty on different approaches to estimate IV. What I'm going to focus on for today, and I think we're going to just have two days of IV, although I may move, uh, stretch it to a third, is today we're just going to be covering up the setup and overview of how to think about instrumental variables. Because there's a lot of different framings and views on it. And I want to kind of give you a holistic way such that if you see it in different settings, you'll kind of understand how they map to one another. Um, with the ideal being that you can bring it back to the kind of design-based way of thinking about things, thinking about there being a research design. Um, and then the, hopefully the goal is that I'm going to try and highlight a bunch of the practical issues that come up for researchers who are working on this in, in the subsequent classes once we have the handle on the framework. So presumably this is not the first place that you ever have heard of IV. So, you know, it's ubiquitous, especially as a research design, you know, when I was in, in college, this was obviously something that was around, but the kind of modern form of it was really only starting to take off. This, this sort of research design focused version of it was really starting to take off. And for many of you, you may have, you probably have seen it in several forms. So well, what I'm going to try and highlight is three different ways of thinking about what this IV can look at. So first, I kind of want to just define what an IV is. And the reason I say that is that like, it's kind of incredible. You can read a bunch of things about instrumental variables in either you know, Journal of Ex Economic Perspectives, et cetera. It's such a ubiquitous tool and concept for us is that defining what we mean by it is almost like, it's like, it's this thing that exists in the either you can, you, so you have to define a version of what we mean by an IV. And then once we sort of have this definition, we're going to use this kind of directed acyclic graph notation to do it because it's actually kind of really convenient to understand the idea is that then we're going to move to this idea of um, how can we do this in kind of the very classic structural econometrics modeling form. And by that, in particular, I mean kind of thinking about constant treatment effects, but kind of just pinning it down in kind of the traditional um, simultaneous equations form that we all kind of get taught initially. And with the idea of linking it to um, GMN, so you can kind of understand that this IV is really 
providing a form of doing moment, having basically moments that allow you to identify parameters. And then in the sort of second half, we're gonna talk about the potential outcomes or design-based setup for it, because this is kind of such a modern um, way of viewing it that I'm gonna try and get you familiar with the language if you haven't seen it before. So what is an instrumental variable? So this is Angrist and Kruger's um, 2002 or 2001 JP um, piece where they said instrumental variables, a search for identification from supply and demand to natural experiments. And so the method of instrumental variables is a signature technique in the econometrics toolkit. So the canonical example and earliest applications of IV involved attempts to estimate demand and supply curves. So hopefully when you learn this the first time, you learn this in the supply and demand. Well, not hopefully, that is likely how you first learned it. It's the idea is that you wanted to estimate elasticities of demand and supply for products. And usually you'd have time series data. So you'd observe prices and quantities. And the issue was, is that is if these things shift over time, the observed quantities, the observed data of quantities and prices reflect a set of equilibrium points on both curves. And so consequentially, an OLS regression of quantities on prices fails to identify, that is, trace out either supply or demand relationship. Wright confronted this issue in a seminal application of instrumental variables, estimating supply and demand for flaxseed, the source of linseed oil. So this is classic IO, is already, already boiled down to one, one product. He noted the difficulty of estimate, uh, obtaining estimates of elasticity of supply and demand from the relationship between the price and quantity alone. He noted, however, that certain curve sh shifters, um, which we now call IV, are, can be used to address this problem. So this is 1928. This is almost 100 years ago now. Such additional factors may be factors which affect demand without affecting cost, so or affecting supply effectively, or which affect cost without affecting demand. And a variable, um, so what he used was substitute goods, uh, to shift around um, the demand curve. And, you know, for a supply curve is the yield per acre, which is primarily being determined by the weather. So, you know, this is from mostly harmless econometrics. They kind of get into it. We're not going to keep reading this, but the, the variables that do the shifting became to be known as instrumental variables. So, you know, shifter variables might have almost been a better name for this, but it's, it's variables that shift things around in an exogenous way. Um, is intuitively what's going on here. And I think even though I, I think you probably have all seen a, seen a version of this, is that it's really useful to kind of textbook see this so you can kind of think carefully about what's going on in IV. So consider kind of the simple supply and demand curve setup. So here I've written down that there's a demand curve, which is quantity demanded is this linear function of price and other, other variables with some, measure, some error. Supply is the same way. It's a linear function of price, right? So hopefully you know, this is like textbook, but it's really helpful because it gets you back to thinking about what's going on, right? So we have, we always do this with price in the numerator, which is annoying, uh, on the y-axis, which is annoying. But remember, supply curves shift up, uh, slope up, demand curves slope down. So I basically, um, written down here, this simple version of the, the graph that I put there, right? So price, it's a linear function of price. It's a linear function um, of quantity. Um, just invert if you want it the other way. Um, and so the point is, is that the equilibrium value, the values that we observe are the ones where they equal to one another, right? So this is like textbook. We this is the observed value and the observed price. And there could be a lot of reasons why they vary, right? So they're talking about a time series example, but we, one could imagine that things happen such that we observe one data point there, and then we get another data point that is when the demand curves look like this. And what happened was is that they both shifted and they look like that. And so then we have another pair of prices that we observe. And then we can keep going with this, obviously. I'm gonna only do a few more just so that the point is clear, is we're gonna get um, 
I'll just do this here. And then we could get another one where maybe what happened is that we, we kind of got a shifter in, in both directions. And so then we get another, and it could be for a variety of reasons, right? So in these three examples that I did, you know, the supply curve was shifting in, but then the demand curve was also shifting out and it can kind of go in both ways. It could also be, for example, that it's not just that things are shifting in and out, but it could also be that the slope is kind of flattening, right? So if the slope flattens, but then you also get shifts that you're gonna get very different um, behavior in this. So anyway, so the point is, is that if you observe these three points or you know, many points of this, you have a cloud, you can't run a regression using the observed data to recover either of the curves. There's a cloud of point with really no real economic intuition. You can't get either demand or supply coefficients, um, elasticities to kind of understand what's going on. It's not that, you know, in this case, it would be basically flat. It doesn't mean that if quantity increases, price doesn't respond. It's basically just that we're capturing very different equilibrium contexts. And so what we need is shifters of these curve to create variation that either traces out supply um, or demand, right? So in, this is basically the idea here is rather than focusing on this piece, we have this cloud of observed points is imagine instead we're back in our example and this is something we'll come back to later is that here we were with our supply and demand and our equilibrium value that we observed. Well, now, if we had something that shifts demand upwards without affecting, um, or excuse me, supply upwards, so contract supply without affecting demand, so some instrumental variable that shifts it, then what we'll do is we'll be able to trace out, this is a new point here, so we'll have a, a Q obs uh, prime p obs effectively sorry um and all we have to do in order to be able to get the elasticity at this point is we need to just look at the delta here and the delta here and that's going to get us the slope at this point Hopefully that's clear to people, right? Like it's not a deeply um, complicated point, but this is exactly what these IV approaches are, are trying to do is it's saying, I need to shift supply without moving around demand. And then as a consequence, I can look at the relative change in these and assert with the assumption that it's not having an effect on demand that exactly traces out um, the demand curve. I think the notable feature that I want you to see, and hopefully this is something that you've seen a version of before, is this is something we're going to come back to when we start talking about the potential outcomes version of the world is remember this is just capturing this local derivative at this point right so we only capture the demand curve over what we've been able to shift so for example you know one could imagine a version of a um demand curve that's much more nonlinear, right so it could look like that and it, and it sort of locally looks linear and then it's much steeper at this part. If we only shift over that, that's maybe a little too extreme. But if we only look here, we're gonna capture some local linear derivative based off of the shift in our instrumental variable. And it's gonna be approximating what the demand curve looks like. Obviously, if we had many, many of these that let us basically shift around and estimate this carefully, that then we can get a better approximation, but we're still not gonna know what the elasticity looks like over here or over here. Is that clear to people? Well, kind of what I, what I highlighted there is that we've already kind of really embedded a lot of information in the way that I modeled this in an equation setup because I said it was linear, right? By assuming a linear supply and demand model, I've already kind of assumed a lot about what's going on. Any questions? Okay. So, um, so the problem, of course, is that like this curve shifting specifically in the context of uh, 
the simultaneous equation models is useful for thinking about supply and demand, which is obviously something we care a lot about as economists, but isn't super extensible. We don't want to think about IV as solely as something that shifts around curves. We want to think about it as this more general um, identification approach. So kind of the, the way that we should, that I think as a general concept that you should think about this, and this is going to help you think about it in the um, design-based way, is to start with the definition in the context of a DAG. So consider the effect that we want, which is that we want the effect of D on Y, right? So this is kind of textbook going back to, to day one. And we know from when we were talking about the impact here is we can't estimate the effect of D on Y because of this um, confounder U, right? This is a, it's a confounder, not a collider because I didn't put the circle around it, but U is not observable is the idea. So we have some unobservable that's driving both of them. And so if we regress D on Y, well, the problem is, is that there's this other thing that it's picking up, which makes sense. The idea is like, there's this un other unobservable that's, that's there's some unobservable here. And so we know that the effect of D on Y isn't identifiable in this setting, cross-sectional. So now we have this variable Z, where under this DAG, what we can do is it can identify two effects. It can identify the effect of Z on D. And we know because it satisfies the Bactoric criterion, which you may or may not remember, is that it also can identify the effect of Z on Y, right? Because basically we can draw a single path from Z to Y and we can identify those effects. There's nothing basically confounding Z and so we're good to go. So what we're gonna talk about these instrumental variables Z is that we're gonna talk about two properties of it. One, so this is, a, this is a typo. This should say the instrumental variable Z is first is relevance. So it affects D. So that, that should read D here. It affects D, that's the relevance criterion for an instrumental variable. And it only affects Y through D is the exclusion restriction. So namely, there's not another path from Z that is affecting Y other than through D. Without any further assumptions, because we're totally non-parametric here, it's not possible to effect, identify the effect of D on Y using just this DAG. But it basically highlights the, the facets of an IV that you need to have, right? That you really need relevance, which is kind of um, relatively straightforward to test. Like that is something you can observe. And the untestable assumption is that you need this exclusion restriction, namely that Z isn't affecting the outcomes through anything other than D. Okay. So, um, Let's talk about, let's first kind of delve into the world um, of we're thinking about structural models. Cause I think this is gonna give, this is gonna give us a tool set to kind of talk about some of the um, um, issues that come up in IV before we delve into the potential outcomes world. So um, the canonical setup for an IV, if this is presumably very familiar to use, you have this two stage least, you have the system of linear equations. So this almost looks a little like what we had um, with our supply and demand equation, but we have some Y variable here where we have some D variable on the right-hand side that we call kind of our endogenous variable. We have some set of controls WI and we have some error turn epsilon. We have this DI, which is a function of some instrument Z, which is excluded from this um, first, the second stage equation is what it's usually called. And then we have the same controls. And, you know, this is pretty canonical. The idea is that W is exogenous. And um, there's a couple of notable features about this setup. So really what we've assumed is we've assumed this very parametric model for YI. So why we're assuming a couple of things, right? So the biggest one is we have assumed that by making this parametric model this way, that beta is constant for everybody. Um, I guess implicitly I've, I'm 
I'm sort of assuming that we're going to treat it like it's a binary variable, but it could be, it could be non-binary. It could be anything. It could be a continuous valued thing. It can be discrete valued. There's some D uh, that we're instrumenting for. And what we need to be able to identify beta and more generally this, this system of equations is we need the two things we discuss. And so what they look like in this setting is relevance, which is that the first stage coefficient pi is not equal to zero. So there's some effect of Z on D once you control for W and the exclusion restriction. And so here, oop, sorry. Um, here, the exclusion restriction in my mind is starts, this is I think where I think things start to get a little confusing or at least I don't love them because I, don't, I never totally feel like I know what epsilons mean. But the epsilon here is this other residual term. And the idea is that there's not something omitted that's in the error term, this structural error term that is basically, we assume that anything in that epsilon, it's orthogonal to our instrument Z conditional on the W. So like the key thing that I want you to understand is that these look like linear regressions. And a lot of time we talked about linear regressions being like an approximation. Like you can do this linear approximation when we talked about things satisfying strong ignorability. In this setting, what we're really doing, we're assuming that this is the true model for YI right now. We're assuming it's this linear model. Now, if D is binary, it starts to get closer, but then we've assumed this kind of linear counterfactual model as well. And so um, this epsilon here doesn't really have a strong interpretation other than it's kind of the residual term. If we want to move it into the potential outcomes framework, then we can start to talk about epsilon i in terms of the potential outcomes for yi. So that's the exclusion restriction. I, in my view, this kind of exclusion restriction definition is slightly opaque. This epsilon i is capturing a set of other things that can happen, but it can be hard to map into a counterfactual way of discussing outcomes. So one thing that I think is useful to kind of understand or highlight here is that um, just for the purposes of having controls and understanding the exclusion restriction is that what we can do is we can talk about zi. So zi is star is what I'm calling it here, which is the residual after pulling out the, um, the, the controls. So ZI minus the expectation of ZI conditional on WI. Can basically think of this as the residualization of Z with respect to W. And the, the exclusion restriction can basically be viewed as saying, if you took the piece of the instrument that's in the, it's orthogonal to W, that piece has to be um, independent or has to be orthogonal to epsilon i. So the variation in zi above and beyond what's in wi has to be exogenous. So, so why basically do we often write this as this system of linear equations? I kind of jumped to doing this system of linear equations. One of the reasons is that we had this it's kind of historically these IVs were these excluded instruments that came from the um, price and quantity equations. But it actually turns out that to SLS is kind of optimal in a particular sense. And so the way to do this, is, let's consider the following is just, just think about there's a more general statement that then will actually, to SLS will kind of fall out of it directly. And so what you can do is you can say, let's consider the more general statement where we're going to still assume that ignore the first stage and we're going to still assume this linear second stage which we're going to call this kind of structural model and to write this compactly we're going to just collapse the di into this di tilde and the zi into this zi tilde where we have these excluded instruments zi and then we have the exogenous um, controls wi which are called the included instruments and basically the idea is that the exclusion restriction gives us K moments where we're basically assuming that the error term, so that's remember YI minus DI beta minus WI gamma, that's epsilon, that that is orthogonal to ZI. And similarly, that this is also orthogonal to WI. 
Yeah, so it's, there's no OVB with respect to WI. Or compactly, we can just write it this way. This is a moment. So this is in the GMM framework. This is what's called a moment. And in GMM, um, you know, we can just define this minimization problem, which says that, look, given a particular moment, um, we can define the estimator or the estimand that we're interested in is, is the solution to the following to the following problem. So these beta zero, gamma zero, they are the minimizers of the squared um, values of these of these terms. So what happens is is that we have this expectation here that basically it's going to be the terms that are the minimizers of this. Right, as we allow beta to vary, there's going to be a, a beta such that, which is beta zero, the true value, which is such that this is equal to zero and, or that this weighted combination is equal to zero. Have you guys seen this before? Have you, how, how much have you guys gone through the, uh, the GMM setup? If I pretend that DAGs is GMM in, in this, have you seen this before? Great, good. Everyone says yes. Now there's hurting because I said it out loud. Um, good. So this is this minimizer. Well, so the key thing here then is that because G is linear, solving for this minimizer is analytically tractable. So the more nonlinear second stages are solvable. So if you can have a more nonlinear model, but then you typically have to do something um, numerical. So our general solution is a function of our choice of this um, omega, right? So we have this omega matrix here. It's the reason we have this is because we have this vector valued set of moments here. We need to sum them up in some way and put weights on certain moments versus others, right? So if there's K moments, we need a K by K matrix that's positive definite such that we, when we sum this up, this is gonna give us um, a scalar, which, which is gonna be our objective function. The general solution is gonna be a function of our choice of omega. And so we get this linear model because this quadratic is basically is solvable where what you get is that um, you get this D prime Z omega Z prime Y D prime Z omega Z prime D. This is a very nice symmetric quadratic property of this. So one thing that kind of is worth noting is that if the exclusion restriction holds and relevance, such that the denominator isn't zero, it doesn't matter what omega is. Your estimator is gonna converge. So if there's no, then that's specifically if there's, we're, we're not allowing for heterogeneity, we're saying we have this homogeneity case. And so in that case, what, ha the re what you do is you plug in for y, this shouldn't be y tilde, it should just be y. And you plug in for y and what happens is that the, um, the epsilon, the d basically, the d beta falls out, you get beta, you move it over. And then you just have this epsilon term. And because of this expectation being equal to zero, this term eventually goes to zero on the limit. So you get consistency irrespective of what your choice of omega is so long as it's positive definite. So where does 2SLS come in? So the reason this is useful is that, and I, I, why I wanted to point it out is that 2SLS basically look, ends up looking like GMM in this very particular setting. So if you look at 2SLS, um, the solution for the two stage least squares model that we wrote down ends up looking like this, where we have the Z prime Z inverse in the middle for both terms. And for GMM, remember we had this omega matrix um, that's in the middle. It turns out 2SLS is exactly just GMM where the weight matrix is equal to the inverse of the covariance of the major, of the instruments. And so, well, why is that interesting? Well, for one thing is that in GMM, there are better ways to get weight matrices to minimize the variance of the estimator. So you could do, for example, two-step GMM or there's these iterated GMM measures. You may or may not have seen this where what you do is you do something data-driven in order to kind of maximize the value of these instruments. It turns out that this weight matrix for 2SLS is actually extremely um, efficient, specifically under the concept of homoscedasticity. So it's, it's actually a very reasonable way to approach this problem that doesn't require you to, to do additional data-driven iteration where 
in a lot of these GMM pr approaches, what you do is first you guess, you get the betas, you, you get epsilons or residuals based off of that. And then you estimate what the, um, the variance matrix looks like and you iterate. Um, in this case, you kind of just know automatically what the optimal solution is. The other thing though that this does is that I think is worth highlighting because it, it kind of shows up exactly what's going on in 2SLS and why it's such a powerful way to think about this is that 2SLS, remember we can write it this way where we have this Z, Z prime, Z inverse Z prime. As soon as you start seeing this form, basically hopefully going forward in the future as you do see more econometrics, anytime you see this, these four together, you should say, oh, that's a projection matrix. So this is just this, this kind of four terms in a row kind of thing. What it's doing is it, it's the projection matrix onto the space of Z. Um, remember when we did this a while ago when we think about linear regression is that P of Z times some variable, say Y, that's gonna give you Y if you ran a regression of Y onto Z and then took that coefficient and multiplied it by Z. So it gets you the Y hat from Z. And the other feature of this is that what you have what's called idempotency. So um, the projection matrix of Z multiplying the projection matrix of Z is equal to the projection matrix of Z. You can kind of, you can square them as many times as you want and they, they just are the same thing over and over. And so what you can say is that, well, actually the 2SLS um, estimator is really just D prime, the projection matrix, um, the projection matrix times Y and the same thing on the bottom, which really what you means you're getting is you're getting the projected value of D onto Z, the projected value of Y onto Z, and then taking kind of the covariance between the two of those and the variance of the projected value on the, on the bottom. Okay. And this seems maybe kind of straightforward, but it's gonna be really helpful for when we start thinking about what's going on visually and we wanna kind of visualize what's going on with IV because it gives us a very standard way of thinking about 2SLS. It's basically this double projection problem where you're projecting onto a subspace of something that's hopefully um, randomly assigned. This is effectively what this curve shifter had in mind, right? Is the idea that I'm gonna construct a predicted value of Q hat at the two values, and I'm gonna get the predicted value of the two, and then I'm gonna have I'm gonna draw a line between the two, and that's how I'm gonna get the I'm gonna get my parameter of interest from that. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. So what's the caveat to this? Um, this approach is basically highly focused on a particular parametric um, specification. And the important assumption that we need to make was this um, exclusion assumption and um, this relevance assumption. And that's the kind of the thing is, is that we didn't assume that anything was randomly assigned. We just had to make this um, mean, this is what's known as mean independence a lot of time, is that this, this, this exclusion restriction here is saying that there's mean independence. We didn't say that ZI is independent of epsilon, we just said that it, the mean was. And, okay, so why is that potentially wonky? So this is the word I used here, this may be um, a good word choice. It's a little weird to assume mean independence and not assume full independence. So now we're gonna we're starting to like dip into where I'm gonna be a little bit heretical, um, or at least this is kind of very much reflecting some people's views and not others. So mean independence is a weaker assumption than full independence, just full stop. Like you don't have to assume as much in the data generating process. But if you care about like things that are robustly make sense from a design standpoint, it's weird to assume mean independence and not think that full independence holds. You may have a model where that's in mind, like something about the average is true, but then you have variances that differ in some way. But the problem is, is that if you assume mean independence and not full independence, is what it implies that taking, it implies that if we took our outcome Y and we did some kind of nonlinear transformation to it, like that wasn't just an affine transformation, 
that our instrument isn't inherently valid anymore. So, you know, you could square our, our outcome or we take the log of it. And then, you know, the point is, is that whatever the episode, the new structural term that we take for this transform value, Z, this expectation of that is definitely not necessarily, there's no implication. They don't nest one another um, that one goes, if it's fully independent, then you're still fine. Then if Z is independent of epsilon, then it doesn't matter what transformations you do of epsilon, you'll still, um, it'll still be valid. So in my view, that is obviously an undesirable property. Now, kind of the punchline though, is that remember when we were talking about difference and difference, that's exactly kind of the same type of property assumption that we were making when we were willing to do these um, parallel trends assumptions. So remember what we said was that for parallel trends to hold, we needed kind of this structural characteristic about it. And I made this point like, well, the problem is, is that if you assume it's parallel in this mean in, in this one value, and then I take logs, it doesn't really imply that you're going to have parallel um, trends in the log of Y, for example. And this is quite a common issue. And that same kind of problem here as our property shows up in this context. Now the with the subject of the caveat, this is much less testable because you can't look at pre-trends. Does that make sense to people, kind of what I'm highlighting here? Um, a lot of times you'll see this kind of weaker version of it defined in these textbooks that it works in these. And the kind of the key thing to think about is just like anytime you have full independence, mean independence holds and so you're fine. I will say that Heckman, at least historically, really preferred mean independence to full independence. So I know that there is a subset of people who would think that this matters more, but it's at least worth thinking hard about why it would make sense in one case and not the other. Okay, so now um, we need the following assumptions. And this is first, just like now to sort of get to like thinking about how we're writing papers. When you do an IV, this is the two things initially that you need. You need relevance and you need the exclusion restriction. So anytime you should be writing this, and we'll talk, we'll just talk about some examples next time of what it looks like is you should be like, you should say something along the lines of, you know, in this paper, we're going to be using an instrumental variable strategy to solve this endogeneity problem. The two necessary assumptions that we're going to need are we're going to need relevance and exclusion. Relevance is inherently testable, right? So why is relevance inherently testable? That's a question to you. It's not rhetorical. Maybe we look at the R score, we can just look at the coefficient and say that it's different from zero, that this is, a, it's, yeah, it's predictive in some way. That's right. So it's observable. It's not confounded in any meaningful way by um, the fundamental problem of causal inference, right? It's like we observe it in, in both in the relevant states of the world. That's right. Now, the exclusion restriction, though, isn't, right? So the idea is like we can't um, inherently test this exclusion restriction. So... Can someone tell me why can't I basically test this? Why couldn't I run this regression, get the beta from it, calculate my residuals and test whether or not this was orthogonal? So it's not testable in part because these epsilons, we basically, those are structural is the way you'd say it, right? They're the structural error terms. And the E's that I'm proposing, these residuals from the regression, they're, they're exactly what Daniel said. They're mechanically set to zero based on the minimization problem. So it's not a exclusion is fundamentally not testable. When people talk about these ideas of fundamentally not testable, what they mean is the following. It means you can't do something and show that it's true. So, you know, that, and obviously the example that Rosie gave, like it doesn't inherently mean that like the coefficient being strongly positive and significant doesn't prove it definitionally, but if it's relatively strong, you can be pretty confident that it's true. The problem is, is that all you can, when I say something is fundamentally untestable, what I mean by it is that you can do tests to potentially show that it's unlikely to be true, but you, you can only kind of support the, de or the defend, defend the assumption by doing tests that you don't fail. <laughs> 
So this is like a lot of times when you're thinking about writing this down, the key thing, and this is kind of very common language, at least in my work and people that I, I work with is, you know, what you say is kind of like the, the identifying assumption of exclusion is fundamentally untestable. However, we can partially test the assumption by trying to look to see if certain things are consistent with this. And this is kind of, we would look for potential channels in which that might be the case. Okay, so those are the two so far. So in this setting, what we've done so far is we've really only required these. And part of that is because we really just assumed these homogeneous effects. And part of that is because we were really parametric in this, right? We put these parametric models down, we assume homogeneous effects, beta is the same for all individuals. We could make that more general. We could allow for beta i's. There are ways to kind of put this by construction in there. Like we already did this in some of our other work. We were talking about allowing for more heterogeneity. The question, of course, becomes like now, what is the S demand that we want out of that? And it's also the other issue with it is it's not a very coherent design-based setup in the sense that it's challenging to think about the shifter Z in terms of the potential outcomes or the potential outcomes of the outcomes, potential outcomes of Y. It's really hard to suss out the validity of the design in a way that we can talk about um, coherently. So what happened really starting in the late 1980s and then in the 1990s and going forward was focused on taking what's called the, the well, you guys know this, the, the, the name and Rubin causal model with potential outcomes and mapping it to the IV setting. And so this was really pushed by Josh Angris, uh, Hito Imbens, and Dom Rubin. And there's a, bu a bunch of papers on this that I'm gonna start touching on and we're gonna do some more um, next week as well, where basically they set up that potential outcomes framework that we've already looked at, but added IV to it. Or, you know, a version of IV that I think we think maps to the definition that we're comfortable with. Um, so let's start by focusing on the simplest of cases. So we have a binary instrument Z, a binary treatment D, we're gonna ignore controls. Those, the no, the controls thing is very easy to relax. Um, you know, if it's, if they're discrete at least. Um, the binary instrument one is gonna be easy to relax. We'll talk about ways to relax the binary treatment one. First, we have to extend the potential outcomes framework. So define yi, it's a function of d and of z, potentially, right? So that yi has potential outcomes, and then di has potential outcomes as well. The exclusion restriction is to enforce that the z, that yi is you basically, irrespective of the of, D, of ZI, the only way that it has an effect is through changing DI. So no matter what Z is, it's just equal to this, this term, that we can basically shut this piece down. So that's, I think, pretty reasonable. That's just a kind of a non-parametric way of writing down what we had before. And then the relevance channel is that the propensity score, so the probability of the assignment, um, as you change the instrument that that changes the probability of treatment. So this is just relevance with a binary variable, right? So another way of saying this, if D, when we had this and it was a linear model was just the idea that the expectation of D conditional on Z that it could be non-binary and then it wouldn't be a propensity score, it would just be a linear outcome, right? And we would just be saying it shifts. And that's the test that Rosie was talking about. So the key point here is that yi1 minus yi0 can be different for every individual. So unlike in structural models we wrote before where beta was constant, we basically have a beta i now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that z is basically completely randomly assigned relative to the potential outcomes um, of y on d, of y and d. Yeah? Is that clear to everybody? So I'm gonna make us, this is like the first time I'm making us walk through an equation because I like sort of did this a bunch of times in graduate school and I always found that it was really helpful for understanding what's going on in this setting. So the first um, result from this Inbens and Angers paper is to say that, look, we have this randomly assigned instrument Z that moves around D, 
under this unrestricted form of heterogeneity, there is no way to estimate the average treatment effect. Well, remember the average treatment effect here is the expectation of, of this treatment, this YI1 minus YI0, that that difference cannot on average be estimated for everyone. And the way to see that is in the following. So consider this difference. So this is the expectation of YI conditional on ZI equals one and Z minus ZI equals zero. So we're gonna say that there's a positive propensity. So it, you increase the propensity of take up if you, um, if you get the instrument, consider this, this term. If we take the difference between these two, so this is observed, right? This would be like running a regression on a dummy. That's what this difference is. That what it's equal to is first you plug in. So you just say, look, YI, the observed YI, that's equal to if DI is on. So remember the ZI is equal to one. So I know ZI is always equal to one here. So it's equal to DI1 times YI1. So that's the one where DI is on plus one minus DI1 times YI0. So for people who have the instrument on, it's this, this first term is just, well, did you take up the treatment or not? And it's going to be some, it's, this is just the potential outcome way of writing that down. Minus sort of the same thing, but for those who the instrument was equal to zero. And basically the key point is that under the independence between ZI and the potential outcomes, because the two of these are independent, the value of ZI doesn't matter for these potential outcomes. And so what you can do is combine these two terms. And what you get is this difference. It's that this difference here is equal to the difference in the DIs times the difference in the YIs. And that's kind of the key crux here is to see that this, because ZI, the actual value of it is independent of the potential outcomes, you can ignore it. This is why you can combine the two. You can basically say, basically what you do is you say that's a conditional statement. And then you say, well, I'll just ignore the conditioning statement because they're independent. Then you just use the additivity of the expectations operator. The point is you can take this term and you can write it in the following way, you can just split it. This is just using um, conditional probabilities and, and splitting, out, um, splitting out this term. In one case, there's, there's basically four cases and we're, this is what we're gonna talk about in just a second. There's four cases. There's ones where DI one minus DI zero is zero. So as you shift the instrument, you don't move. And so for both of those cases, that's always equal to zero. So just ignore those cases. Then there's the case where the difference is equal to one. So then we can pull that probability out and we can say, okay, conditional on that being equal to one, here's the treatment effect for those people. And then because, um, because it's a minus, so you know, if the probability, if it goes the other direction, so if, if the difference between these two is minus one, then this would be a minus. And so the minus comes out here. And then we're looking at the treatment effect of those individuals. And the idea is, right, is that these are people who've been moved from one direction. They are, they, the instrument increases, but they actually went in the other direction. So there's a lot to unpack here. Um, let me pause there for a second. Did anyone not understand what we were doing in terms of rewriting? A lot of times with this potential outcome stuff, it's really like A, the independence assumption, or B, rewriting notationally something in, in, in a manner that looks more um, intuitive. Any questions? Okay. So, so this is just that same term. So let's unpack what's in here. So the first thing that I wanna unpack is that while we assume that the propensity score was increasing, so remember that was like an assumption I just said here, right? I said, oh, P1, that, that's the average, right? I'm just saying that on average, this is the regression that we ran at the beginning. We said, look, we run this regression of D on Z and we get a positive coefficient. So relevance holds. Even though relevance holds and the propensity score is increasing, the coefficient is positive, it doesn't mean it's increasing for everyone, right? That's inherently, I mean, it's just in here in the sense that 
it could be the case that for some people it's increasing, but then for some people it's not. What the propensity score is going to capture is going to capture the net difference, the net amount of people who are shifted. But it might be within that net difference that some of those people are going to be negative and some of them are going to be positive. So like a way to think about this is that we have, oops, we have like a, um, the idea is like we have some propensity value here where this was the propensity to do it. So then here's zero. Here's the propensity without the instrument. Here's the propensity with. This is some positive value. Well, the issue is, is that like, what it might be capturing is that, well, there were a lot of people who had shifted, but then there was also this reduction such that the net impact was this difference. And then there's this group that got partially netted out. So that's the first thing. So this is problematic because it means like relevance isn't, uh, isn't everything. The second thing is that we're only identifying the effects of um, D for those individuals whose behavior was shifted by the change in Z, right? So these conditional expectations are only for people who are shifted. We talked about the, there's those people, right? Who the DI one minus DI zero is equal to zero. Those could be people who aren't shifted at all. Like they weren't willing to take it versus people who would always do it. And we'll talk about that terminology. And then finally, is that without restrictions on YI or the additional assumption I'll make in a second, this effect could be zero, it could be positive, or, you know, so it can be anything, even if the true causal effect on average is positive. And basically the idea is that the, you know, it could be that the average effect is positive, but the shifters basically exactly cancel it out because they have a bigger positive effect who got to, who basically chose not to take it. And since it's canceling it, it's going to net, it's going to net out this effect and we'll actually see it basically zero overall effect. These are just, you can, I mean, it's a stylized example. It's not inherently obvious that it's going to happen, but the problem is, is that it, it allows for arbitrary kinds of um, values of this. So historically, there are kind of two potential solutions to this issue. In the constant effects world, this doesn't happen. This doesn't matter. And the reason is basically that like, there is no netting out because as long as there's a positive, um, as long as there's relevance, basically what happens is that you, everyone has the same effect. And so it can't cancel out one another because you, you potentially would need a larger effect in one group versus the other. So constant effects world, this problem doesn't exist. And so this is why we don't see this come up when we were talking about traditional GMM. Um, the other way that this can kind of be solved is, is that if there was an instrument such that there was never anyone for whom there was a this this restriction so that the di1 minus di0 so that if you do the instrument that it um drops you so basically that this is zero the idea being that if you start from here if if this is the base case so let me put it another way if p0 equals zero so if you don't have the instrument you'll never take up the treatment then it will also be satisfied, you'll be fine. This is basically what's known as one-sided compliance. So if you're in like the medical world, it's the idea like what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna randomly allocate the treatment to people. Those who didn't get randomly allocated it, they could never take up the treatment in the first place. And so then you don't have to worry about anyone shifting in the wrong direction because they basically, they don't have a choice. It wasn't those people who, um, got randomized that they're not allowed to, they're, they're, they can't shift in the other direction, the people who didn't get it. So they, that's fine and that's very helpful. One side of compliance shows up in, in, in a lot of encouragement design cases, um, but it doesn't always occur. And it turns out that this design, this effect basically is a version of 
it's a, it's subsumed in this idea of monotonicity. So monotonicity is this assumption that's going to allow you to identify what's called the local average treatment effect or late. And what this is, is saying that DI1 is greater than or equal to DI0 for all I or vice versa. So it just has to go in one direction. Basically, the idea is that the effects have to be monotone in the same direction. And the problem with this is it's also fundamentally untestable. It suffers from exactly the same problem, the fundamental problem of causal inference. And this solution that we were talking about with Rosie doesn't work because you need to see it within the same person. So what I need is if I randomly assign the treatment or the instrument to Leland, I'd have to be able to see both his decision in the world where he got the instrument and where he didn't get the instrument. And so you have to fundamentally see both state um, versions of the world. What's really nice is that conditional on assuming um, monotonicity, this walled ratio estimates the local average treatment effect. So um, th this walled ratio here is, remember this was that thing we were just looking at, the EY condition on ZI1 minus EY of condition on ZI0, that that term, what happens is, is now we've nixed one of the, the terms. So we've said, I basically am assuming that the DI1 minus DI0 can't be negative one. So there's no one going in the other direction. That part is of, assumed by definition to be zero. Then all I have is this part on the top. And then I'm dividing by this propensity score, which is exactly what this propens this difference is gonna be. So we scale by the, we cancel these out. And what we'll get is, it basically shows that this walled, ratio, this walled ratio here is gonna get you exactly this late, which is specifically the treatment effect conditional on being shifted. So what does this mean? So like, if you've seen a version of this before, you may be like, okay, great. Like I've seen this before, so what? Um, fundamentally, this was a huge deal because the idea was that, you know, people really wanted to identify average treatment effects. And there's a, there's a very negative view of this. We now talk about it in a very positive way for the most part, because we're like, look, this IV assumption lets us identify blah. But historically, really the point was to say, look, non-parametrically, all you can identify is the local average treatment effect. There's no way you can identify the average treatment effect um, without extrapolating. And the, what you needed to do that was you needed this monotonicity assumption in order to ensure that all responders all go in one direction. And so the language, I've been using this a little bit because it's so hard for me not to in the way that I talk about, there's basically language used to describe these groups. Um, that you should be familiar with and sort of talking about this is that um, basically the idea is that there's four groups, right? If you think about the instrument values, so here we had a binary instrument. So with the binary instrument, there's four types of um, responders that we see. There's those who would always take the treatment. DI1 would be equal to DI0, which means, and it would be equal to one. They would always take it. Then there's what's called the never takers. So they would always set it equal to zero, irrespective of the instrument choice. We don't know anything about them. We don't know what their average treatment effect is. We actually don't even have to make any assumptions about their distribution, um, but they're fundamentally not known. Then we have the group that's called the compliers. So comply, obviously it could go both ways. A sign is sort of irrelevant. Here we just sort of always make the positive thing uh, be the compliers, but the compliers are those whose participation is induced by the instrument. So you go from zero to one, that makes you likely to take up the treatment. And in contrast, the defiers are the ones who go in the opposite direction. And what monotonicity ensures is that only one of the compliers or the defiers groups exists. So we always talk about the compliers, but really all it is, is you just have to get rid of one of these. And the key thing is, and we're going to talk about this um, next time, is that these groups can be very different, right? There can be different characteristics. The types of people who respond to incentives may look very different in the always takers versus the never takers. 
And so one result um, that we'll talk about is that, um, and this actually relates to what we were just talking about. We actually, if you assume monotonicity, you can say something about how big the compliers are. Does anyone know this result? Kind of, how would I measure what share of the population are compliers? Does anyone have a guess on this? If I draw a picture, it, it will become more apparent. It's like a version of this picture. Remember how I told you there's this idea that there's this basically the set of people, um, there's this propensity, this is like the probability um, that di equals one, right? Well, um, the probability conditional on z equals zero, say it's here, and then, sorry, and then the cat, this is, this is one, right? So this is like, if you net inherently took it, and then this is the probability that z equal, um, that the probability of di equals one for z equals one. Well, the share, this only works with a binary treatment, but the difference the difference in the propensity scores is the share of the population that is compliers. So that's like a first thing to think about is that what's really, um, we're gonna delve into this a little bit more when we talk next week when we talk about Abadi's cap Kappa, but it's, it's pretty tightly linked to what we were talking about with Rosie of like, you can test the relevance assumption. It's like, well, with the monotonicity assumption, actually the size of the first stage coefficient in the binary case is the share of the population that is being induced by your instrument. So, you know, if you see this here and it's large, well, that means it had a big effect in the first stage. So there were a lot of people who had changed and the compliant group was big. In contrast, if, you know, the, that first stage coefficient is relatively small, that means there was a very relatively small share of people who were induced by the instrument. Um, so that's one thing that you can do in this, which kind of becomes even more powerful that you'll see shortly is actually what you can even do is you can calculate what the subgroups means are, the complier means are in this. You can actually know something about the mean of the compliers relative to the overall population. So what you might worry about in a, in a IV setting is you might say, well, am I worried that the people who are taking this up look very different than the overall population? And you can actually estimate characteristics of the compliers in this. Um, and I'm gonna, I, I didn't get it into the slides today, but we're gonna talk about it next week. One thing that I just wanted to highlight, um, cause I, this isn't like always totally obvious, but I, I feel like I want you to know this is, I, can, I said this thing about the Wald ratio here, which is these difference in means, the ratio. I just wanted to be clear, like if you're doing the two SLS, with binary variables, that's the same thing as difference in means. So um, I'm not gonna write out the notation for it, but like if you write down the covariance of yi zi over the covariance of di zi. So that's right, remember that's the same thing as having y alpha plus di beta plus epsilon di equals, I don't know, pi zero plus uh, z i pi one plus ui, right? This is to us, can you guys see that? Sorry, um, this is to SLS. And so then you run this regression, if it's binary, that's the, what's the covariance between, if yi is some continuous value and d and z is a binary thing, Remember what the definition of a um, of the covariance is. Well, it's this minus. Um, da, 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 da. I'm gonna write this down wrong. Um, 
So this is the definition of a covariance. And um, what am I doing here? What I want to get it to is, oh my goodness. Oh, it's because I'm, I'm hold on. The point, let me tell you the punchline and then I'll try and be able to do this on the fly. The point is that this is the same thing as writing down this. The covariance between a binary variable and some continuous valued one is, is equal to the difference in the expect and the conditional expectations. And then the way that I'm gonna show you that is I'm gonna show you that by, um, let me make sure I can do this. You should feel free to chime in if you see me struggling and I can't and I can't do it. Um, can you shift cameras? Oh yes, sorry. Thank you. My light is not as good today. It was such a crappy day weather-wise. I feel like usually I have incredible light in here. Um, all right, let's see if I can do this on the spot. This is probably a mistake. Um, so this term here is, no, that's not going to do it. Hold on. Uh, what am I doing? So, feel, someone feel free to rescue me if, if I'm doing it wrong. Um, I'm, I'm going to give me one second. First term is EYI conditional on ZI equals to one. I'm also just thinking out aloud. Yeah, no, it's, it's, so this is definitely, so this term here, right, is equal to, oh my goodness. I should have solved this out beforehand. I know how to do this. And I, um, well, here's the easiest way to do this. Here's the easiest way to solve. This is why this is actually sort of confusing. Is because what we're talking, sorry, this is the why we're running into this issue. The, it's the following statement, sorry. So remember, this is, we're running this here, right? Another way of saying this is that DI is binary. If we plug in for DI, remember what the reduced form is. We get alpha plus, then we're gonna get um, pi beta plus uh, ZI beta pi one, sorry, pi zero, um, plus beta epsilon I plus UI, right? Is that clear to people? That's just like, I just plug in DI into this. Then this is a binary value. This is our constant now. Then we have this new coefficient here, call it gamma. Um, and then this is our new error term, um, V. And conceptually, what we know is that the constant is going to be the value when zi is equal to zero. And it's going to be the mean. And then Sorry. Um, and then uh, ZI is going to be when the coefficient on this is gamma is going to be equal to the mean of ZI when ZI equals, equals one relative to the mean when um, ZI equals zero. That's probably the easiest just slot dash way of doing it. I'll put into the notes exactly how you solve it. But the point is, is that this is just obviously the difference in means, because this is going to be the baseline mean, and this is going to be the relative change when zi is equal to one. So that's why you get this coefficient in the in the reduced form. And then on the denominator, it's kind of the same exercise, but in the first stage. Anyway, all I wanted to highlight there was that I wrote down, I made I basically did this jump here where I said, let's do the wall estimator. Another way of saying this is we do two SLS with Y and a binary ZI. This is the same thing. So Apologies for the um, slapdash explanation of that. Okay, let me in the last few minutes just say the following. So what I described so far is a really specific way of doing this. We had a binary Z, binary D, but it's really straightforward to generalize this to a multi-valued instrument. So, so far I was just telling, I 
everything that I did in that definition, I was doing ZI goes from, um, from one to zero or zero to one, but it's really straightforward to, to switch that in the other, to having multiple values and what you'll do in the same way. Remember we did potential outcomes, but we allowed it to change um, in, in multiple fashions. That's pretty straightforward. And then you end up weighting these up in a particular way and you're gonna get a weighted group of compliers. Um, Right, what you'll just have is now where we had one shifter, what we'll have is that we'll have yet another value here where the idea has to be that DI, as you move from one value of it to the other, you're gonna order your instrument as a function of it always increasing people in a particular direction. That's the monotonicity assumption that you need to have. You need monotonicity to hold between any two pairs of instruments that you put into an order based off of that. Then, that so there's ways to do that and that's relatively straightforward. The kind of more challenging and notationally to, thing to do is to generalize the multi-value treatment in a non-parametric way. So remember when we did that, the supply and demand curve, the idea there is that there was actually, you know, the, the treatment variable, what we've been calling D here, was actually kind of price, right? We cared about shifting around this continued, va continued valued thing. And I made this point, um, I wish I flipped it over so that it was there, but still there. Remember there was this idea that we could shift it, but the curve, you know, we wanted to do infinitesimal changes in the curve in order to be actually be able to trace it out. And so the point is, is that if we use this instrumental variable to shift things, what we're gonna be doing is capturing basically an average of de derivatives of that curve over the space of it, depending on where our shifter is moving um, quantity and price. So the idea, this is what's called the average um, causal response curve. Um, it's basically a combination of weighted derivatives depending on where the instrument shifts participation. And this is, this is in um, the Angrist and Imben's uh, JASA article. Okay, so, let me kind of just wrap up and, and um, highlight what we're gonna talk about going forward. Um, basically, monotonicity is kind of a really powerful tool for ensuring that we're getting um, these weighted average of true causal parameters. So like weights where the weights are convex, like we're getting an actual thing. But monotonicity is a really pretty powerful assumption in some places. Um, if it fails, it doesn't mean that there isn't a causal, um, causal causal uh causal effect identified but what it, it like you really do need to be careful about this so what we're going to do is we're going to talk next next class about sensitivities and other issues that can come up in the iv setting and an important note that i want to highlight because this comes up a lot um when writing research papers is in the end remember that our iv estimate so here effectively is we basically have this reduced form estimate. So the effect of Z on Y scaled by this first stage, right? That's how we got this estimate. That's the kind of the true estimated effect of D on Y. And then there's some, there's different terminologies that's used for this, but this, this difference up top here is sometimes called the reduced form or the intent to treat, so the ITT. So those are different terms that you may end up hearing. So the the effect of Z on Y, well, it was something where you like, I randomized you guys a treatment and then only some of you took it up. Well, that initial randomization is the intent to treat you. That's something that we can causally estimate irrespective of monotonicity, but we need more assumptions of what we care about is the actual take up of the medicine in the first place. So the reduced form is something that you can estimate pretty well without making all these assumptions. And so what becomes more challenging is, um, you know, do you really need the rescaled estimate? And so what it's gonna come down to, and the reason I mentioned this is that the exclusion restriction is, is challenging um, to defend at times. And so remember we talked about some of these settings where we were thinking about like historical um, changes and things we talked, we were talking about these spatial things, right? Where it's like, historical features of cities are affecting outcomes nowadays. And say you're using that as an IV for something, the historical feature of a city 
The problem is, is that like whether or not the, the exclusion restriction holds in these settings. So you're going to have something that you're going to think of as kind of quasi randomly assigned in some meaningful way. And you may want to use it in an IV, but the kind of problem or concern is that while it may be randomly assigned, it doesn't necessarily give you the ability to estimate um, to SLS or something with an IV that it makes it a good IV per se. We're going to kind of come back to this uh, next week. So let me stop there. Does anyone have